This is Sarah Threads to NurseRN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be going over tuberculosis. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the respiratory system. And as always, at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Tuberculosis is a contagious bacterial infection caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And tuberculosis tends to mainly affect the lungs. Specifically, it resides in those upper part of the lungs, so the apex. And here in a moment, you will know why. But it's not just limited to the lungs. Once it gets in the body, it can spread to the lymphatic system and it can travel to the brain, the joints, the liver, the spine, and the kidneys. So remember that, because a lot of times whenever people think of TB, they think of, oh, it just affects the lungs, but it can affect other areas of the body as well. Now let's talk about this bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Number one, it is an acid fast bacteria, which means whenever you collect sputum on this patient, which you're gonna be doing a lot for patients who you're testing for tuberculosis, you will send it to the lab and they will do a special test where they're going to do an acid fast staining procedure. And if this is indeed mycobacterium tuberculosis, it will stain a bright red color. In addition, this bacteria is aerobic which means that it absolutely loves oxygen. So it needs lots of oxygen in order to thrive and grow, which is why this bacteria likes to reside in those upper parts of the lobe, the apex, compared to the base, because this is where you have the higher amounts of oxygen. Now, how is tuberculosis spread to other people? Because it's contagious. Well, if you have a person, like our little man here on the board, if they have active tuberculosis, which means that they're having signs and symptoms associated with the infection, they've had a positive sputum culture for this bacteria, their chest x-ray is abnormal, and they've had like a positive skin test or blood test. So they have active tuberculosis. So anytime that this person creates an action that's going to make droplets that harbors this bacteria, such as yelling, coughing, talking, laughing, when they expel that out of through their nose and their mouth, they are putting this bacteria into the atmosphere, the air, for others to come along and breathe in. When they breathe it in, it'll go down into their airway and this bacteria loves oxygen, so it'll hang out in the lungs and depending on if this patient has a strong immune system, what's going on with them, they can develop active tuberculosis. Now, why is this? Why is this airborne rather than like droplet? Well, this bacteria is very small. So it can suspend itself in the air. Instead of with like droplets, those bacteria viruses are large, they don't stay in the air very long at all, and they fall onto the surfaces or wherever it can fall. So as a nurse providing care to this patient, what are you gonna wear? Well, first of all, they're in airborne precautions. What goes along with that? You'll wanna wear a respirator anytime providing care around that patient at all, not a surgical mask because a respirator like an N95 mask is special in that it will help filter out this small bacteria so you won't breathe it in. In addition, on top of that, they will need special ventilation in the room and a negative pressure room to help prevent spreading that bacteria and you want to keep that door closed. Another thing is looking at your risk factors. Whenever you're getting these patients, they're presenting maybe with signs of tuberculosis. You want to look at those risk factors, which we're gonna go over here in a moment. Because with tuberculosis, the patient has to be in contact with others for a specific amount of time, which is why patients who are in long-term healthcare facilities, their inmates in prisons, homeless shelters, where people are living in tight quarters with each other, they're at risk for majorly spreading to it to other residents or other people who live there. So now let's look at those risk factors. And I would remember these factors for tests because test questions can arise from this material. So to help us remember the risk factors for someone developing tuberculosis, let's remember the mnemonic TB risk. TB stands for tuberculosis. So our T, of course, what I just talked about is tight living quarters. And these are your patients who are living close proximity together. They are in long contact, which just gives them time to be 
overexposed to this bacteria hanging out into the air and they can contract it. Next, be below or at the poverty line. And these are people who don't have great access to healthcare because they just can't afford it, such as people who are homeless, are refugees also immigrants who are coming from countries where there are high cases of tuberculosis? Next, I for immune system issues. Example, a person who has HIV. Whenever a person has HIV, they have a weak immune system, so that makes them more susceptible to tuberculosis. Or they're taking immunosuppressant drugs, which suppresses the immune system. So anytime you see a test question says patient has HIV or taking these type of drugs, think, okay, risk for tuberculosis. S for substance abusers, these include people who use IV drugs or are alcoholics. And last K for kids, kids less than the age of five. Their immune system isn't fully developed, it's weak, so they are definitely at risk for tuberculosis, especially if they're residing in a house with someone who has active TB. So as a nurse, we need to really assess for those risk factors and how do we do it? Well, we ask specific questions on admission and your documentation, the paperwork that you're doing whenever you're admitting a new patient is gonna have questions similar to this. And if you have a patient who's coming in for respiratory issues, you wanna be thinking in this realm. You know, it's rare to have tuberculosis patients here in the US, but you do have them. I have provided care for patients who do have active tuberculosis. So you want to make sure you're thinking about it because it can happen still. So you wanna ask your patient, have you traveled outside of the US or lived outside of the US? If so, where was it and how long? Are they from one of those countries that have high rates of tuberculosis? Next, where do you live? Where's home for you? Are they from a long-term care facility like a nursing home? Are they an inmate in a prison, which you'll usually be tipped off for that because they'll have a guard with them. Or do you live in a homeless shelter? Also, do they use drugs? If so, what type of drugs? Because we're looking for really IV drug use because that not only puts them at risk for tuberculosis, but at risk for HIV. And having HIV dramatically increases the chance of them having tuberculosis because of the weak immune system. Then you wanna ask them, were you born here in the US or were you born in another country as a child? Because in some countries, they give the vaccine to prevent tuberculosis because they have high rates of tuberculosis called the BCG vaccine, also known as the Bacillus calmet Gayran vaccine, and this prevents tuberculosis. But the thing you want to remember with this vaccine, and I would remember this, that if your patient has had this vaccine as a child, they, whenever you, if you give them one of those skin tuberculin tests, the PPD test, they will have a false positive because they've already been exposed to the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Their immune system recognizes it because they had a vaccine. So they're gonna have a false positive. So it's best for them to have like a blood test, which we're gonna go over the testing here in a moment, and a chest x-ray to rule that out. In addition, you wanna ask them about their signs and symptoms because when active tuberculosis presents, they will have these specific signs and symptoms, which are coughing that lasts for three weeks or more. So ask them, Okay, you're coughing. How long has this been happening? Also ask them, what does their sputum look like? Are they coughing up blood? Do they have a fever, night sweats, fatigue, unintentional weight loss, chills, a loss of appetite, they just don't feel like eating, or they're having chest pain or pain with breathing or coughing. All can be related to an active tuberculosis infection. And of course, you also want to ask them, have you had a TB skin test? If so, when was it? And do you remember the results? And you'll want to try to access those results if possible. Now let's talk about latent tuberculosis infections versus active tuberculosis infections. And I would remember the differences between the two for testing purposes. Purposes. Okay, not everyone who actually inhales that mycobacterium tuberculosis is going to develop a full-blown case of active TB. Because what happens is that when many people breathe this in, our immune system recognizes it and it's strong enough to take care of it. So what it does is it says, hey, this should not be here. We are going to fix this. So the army of our immune system comes in and it surrounds that 
bacteria and it encapsulates it. Now, this person at this point has latent tuberculosis infection, but the body is keeping it dormant. Now, what can happen is that this bacteria can become active again. Why would it do that? Well, when the immune system becomes weak, or let's say the person gets HIV, so it can become active again and it can turn into active tuberculosis, which is what happens with a lot of these cases that we see. Many cases were person inhaled this a while back, their immune system had it under control for a while, but then the immune system broke down and this germ got out and was able to infect and cause an active infection. So let's look at the differences between the two. How your, how's your patient going to present? So first with latent TB, person has just inhaled it. Their immune system is keeping it under control. And most people are not going to develop an active infection. They need that weakening of the immune system or something to make that germ come back alive. So are they going to be contagious? No, the immune system has it under control. Will they have signs and symptoms? No, they're not going to. They're going to have an abnormal chest x-ray. No, their chest x-ray is going to be normal because it's not causing any problems. How's their sputum? Is it going to have that mycobacterium tuberculosis in it? No, it's going to be negative. So they're not really going to know. The only how they will know is whenever they go and get a skin test done, the PPD tuberculin skin test or the blood test, they will test positive for it. And that is because their immune system has seen this bacteria before. It's created this response to it. So when we inject that, um, the PPD in their forearm or they get a blood test, we will see that their body reacts to it. Now, do patients who have latent tuberculosis still need treatment? Yes, they do, because it'll prevent them from having a possible active infection in the future. Now, according to cdc.gov, people who do not receive treatment, about five to 10% of them will actually develop an active TB infection. So they still need treatment, those medications. Now let's look at active tuberculosis. Are they contagious? Absolutely. They have this bacteria in here that our immune system just can't deal with. So it's flourishing and can infect others. Are they going to have signs and symptoms? Absolutely. They'll have those signs and symptoms that we just went over. Their chest x-ray is going to look abnormal. They're going to have a positive sputum culture because that bacteria is in there which is why it's contagious because they're putting it out when they cough, laugh, breathe, yell. And one thing that these two will share is that this person, of course, will also have a positive tuberculin skin test and a positive blood test. And with this active TB, because it is in the system not being controlled by the immune system, it can easily spread via the lymphatic system and affect those other structures other than the lungs, like the brain, the joints, the liver, the kidneys, and etc. Now let's talk about the testing that can be used to help diagnose a patient with tuberculosis. Because as the nurse, you're going to play an important role in administering some of these tests and interpreting some of the results. So first, let's talk about the PPD skin test. This has a lot of names. It's also called the Mantu test, TB skin test, tuberculin skin test. You may see it abbreviated TST. All of it's the same thing. It just has a lot of names. Now, what is this? Okay, this is where a patient is injected with purified protein derivative with a tuberculin needle, it's a special needle, on the inner part of the forearm. And as a nursing student, and I know as a nurse, you have had this type of test done. And after injection, it will look very similar to this picture right here. It will be nice and raised up after they have injected that into the forearm. Now, whenever you give this test to a patient, you have to tell them that they have to come back and you have to assess the site or someone else who's qualified the site within 48 to 72 hours and anything over 72 hours they'll have to repeat it and what you're assessing for is in duration of that injection site which is is it hard and raised up and you're going to measure it in millimeters we're not looking at the redness we're looking at the in duration 
So how do we interpret results? And I would remember this for testing purposes because the results are based on certain criteria based on those risk factors we just went over, which is why I wanted to cover those with you. So you're measuring the site. If it measures 15 millimeters or more, that is positive in everyone. If it measures 10 millimeters or more that is positive in a person who's an immigrant an IV drug user works or is living in one of those tight living quarter areas or a child less than four if the site is five millimeters or more that is positive in a person who has HIV or if the person's been in contact with another person who has active tuberculosis they've had an organ transplant or their immune system is suppressed, say that they're taking drugs that suppress it. So that would be considered positive. Now, just remember that just because a patient has a positive result doesn't mean that they have active tuberculosis. They could have latent or they could have active. So you need to get a chest x-ray and a sputum culture to help differ differentiate between that because this test does not do that. Another type of test is a blood test where instead of injecting the PPD in the forearm, they will just draw blood and it will look at the immune system's reaction to this mycobacterium tuberculosis and they'll put that in these three special tubes. So these tests are called interferon gamma release assays and IGRA, a lot easier to say. And there's two types that are on the market currently. You have the quantiferon TB gold, the QFT test, or the T-spot test. Now the benefits over this blood test over the PPD test is that the patient doesn't have to return to have the results read. In addition, it's great for patients who have had that BCG vaccine, the Bacillus, Calmet, Gayran vaccine, so they won't get a false positive with this. And this test is becoming a little bit more popular than the PPD test. Now, one thing this test doesn't do as long, along with the PPD test is it does not tell if the patient has latent TB or active TB. They will need a chest x-ray and a sputum culture to help differentiate that. Another thing that can be ordered is of course a sputum culture and we've talked about that a little bit already where they can do an AFB smear, an acid fast bacillus smear and they do that special stain and what color will it stain if it is this bacteria, that bright red color. And they can obtain the sputum through either the patient coughing it up or if the patient can't do that, they can do a bronchoscopy where they can go in and collect sputum. Now as a nurse who's gonna be collecting those sputum cultures, you need to know that you will collect the sputum on three, you'll collect three different collection specimens on three different days. And it is best to collect it in the morning before the patient has breakfast because they've just got up and that is where there's a lot of those respiratory secretions from after they just got up from sleep. And of course, a chest x-ray can be ordered. They can look at the imaging for that and look for specific findings that's found in tuberculosis. Here you can see a normal chest x-ray. You can see the right and the left lung. It's nice and clear. However, this patient has pulmonary tuberculosis and you can see the chest cavity and the lungs and you can see interstitial infiltrates on both of the lungs due to a TB infection. Now let's talk about nursing interventions and treatment for tuberculosis. Okay, you have a patient who has active TB. They're the ones with those signs and symptoms and they're contagious. What are you going to do? You wanna put them in airborne precautions, which entails what again? Following standard precautions plus always wearing a respirator while providing care to that patient in that patient's room, so that N95 mask and the patient will need to be in a negative pressure room. That door stays closed all the time. And if it does open, it will let you know because it will start beeping. Also, you need to ask yourself, okay, how about this patient has to leave the room to go down for, for testing? A lot of times, testing can be done in the room at the bedside, but sometimes they have to go down to have a special procedure. If they do have to leave the room for that, you'll want to put a surgical mask on them. So remember that. 
Now, most patients with active tuberculosis, unless they're having complications, are treated as an outpatient at their home because treatment for this takes about six months to a year to treat. They're gonna be on like four different medications and treatment would just be way too expensive for them to be in the hospital for that long. So you want to provide some education pieces to the patient to educate them. So if they have active TB, they're tr being treated at home, they will have to remain in isolation. This means they can have absolutely no visitors, they can't go to school, they can't work, they can't go to public outings. The only place they can go if they have to is to medical appointments. And whenever they do that, they need to wear a surgical mask because they're contagious and can spread this to other people. Also, if they live in a home with other people, they have to keep a separate room and stay away from those people so they don't spread it, especially if you have little children in the house and doors and windows need to stay closed at all times. Now the patient is coughing, sneezing, they always need to do that in a paper towel and dispose of that immediately by flushing it or keeping it in an airtight baggie and disposing of that. And when can this person come out of this isolation? Well, whenever they have been on their medications for at least three weeks. They, their sputum cultures will hopefully start to become negative and they will need three negative cultures and their signs and symptoms need to be improving in order for them to meet criteria to be out of isolation and be able to live a normal life again. And another thing I want to point out so you're just familiar with it is DOT, directly observe therapy. And this is when a person will actually come out to the person's house who has TB and they will give them their medications and actually watch them swallow the medications and observe them for any signs and symptoms of complications or answer any other questions. And this is usually like a public health nurse or someone who's specially trained in doing this. And this helps increase compliance with these medications because these patients have to be on these anywhere from six to 12 months and they're taking them at different times and it can get confusing or they can just forget to take them, which is leading to an increase in drug resistant TB. So the CDC recommends that all patients with tuberculosis are on this DOT program to help um, prevent non-compliance and prevent so much drug resistant TB. Now let's switch gears and let's talk about the medications used to treat tuberculosis. We're going to talk about five different drugs, but we're really going to concentrate on four of them because they are the ones that are main line in treating tuberculosis. So to help us remember those four drugs, let's remember the word peri. Peri means surrounding, around. And what happens with TB is that normally our body will surround that germ and encapsulate it. Well, our body's really not doing that. So we have to have these medications on board to surround and kill these bacteria. So that's how I like to remember it. So P, pyrazinamide, which has bactericidal effects, which is a fancy way of just saying it kills the bacteria. Now you need to watch this drug in patients who are diabetic, have kidney problems, or gout, because pyrazinamide increases uric acid levels. And we learned in our gout video, that's the whole reason for a gout attack is whenever a patient's uric acid levels are increasing. So the doctor is gonna be monitoring those uric acid levels. You as the nurse need to be looking for signs and symptoms of a gout attack happening. It usually likes to start in the big toe, the great big toe, and it'll be red and warm. Patient will have limited mobility and it'll be extremely painful. In addition, this drug can cause liver and kidney problems. So be monitoring that as well, looking for jaundice, look at their urinary output. And GI upset is common with this drug, so administering it with food will help decrease that. E for ephemutol, and what this drug does is it stops RNA synthesis. So it's bacteriostatic, which means that it prevents the bacteria from reproducing. 
Now with this drug, it can inflame the optic nerve. So as the nurse, be thinking about vision and educating your patients to immediately report if they have any vision changes, like their visions become blurred or they have a change in how they perceive color and they will need regular eye checkups. It can also cause peripheral neuropathy and this is where you have damage to those peripheral nerves. So be asking your patients, are you feeling any numbness or burning in your extremities? Because this can happen and if you do have a patient report numbness, burning in their extremities or vision changes, you want to notify the physician immediately about this. R for rifampin, and this drug works to stop RNA polymerase. And what that does is it kills the bacteria. Now there's some things you wanna educate your patient on because there's one thing that they're probably gonna notice and it can really make them scared if you don't tell them about it. One thing is that it can turn their body fluids orange and their tears, their sweat, their urine will be orange and you'll want to reassure them about that and tell them if they do wear contact lenses, especially those soft kind, it will permanently stain those. So they'll wanna switch and wear hard lenses. In addition, educate your patients who are on hormonal like birth control that it will be less effective. So they want to use backup methods and watch going out in the sun because they can sunburn easily. It makes the skin more sensitive and absolutely no alcohol while taking this medication. Really with all these drugs for tuberculosis, your patients want to avoid alcohol because the liver can be affected with almost all these drugs. So no alcohol and teach them about signs and symptoms of liver issues like jaundice, they're having issues bleeding. I for isoniazid, also INH. And what this drug does is it kills bacteria and stops its growth. But one thing that this drug can also do is decrease vitamin B6 levels. So a lot of patients who take this are going to be on supplements. And you'll want to assess your patients for that peripheral neuropathy that can happen during low vitamin B6 levels, like ask them, are you having tingling in your extremities? Do you feel excessively tired, depression, which can all point to that, that vitamin B6 is low. And again, monitor liver function and for neurotoxicity. And lastly, streptomycin. Now this drug isn't as commonly used as those other four I went over because of its side effects, but it is used in some patients and I want you to remember the big thing with that. One thing is that it stops protein synthesis and it kills bacteria, but a big side effect of this that you wanna watch out for is their hearing. So you wanna monitor their hearing and ask the patients, are you having any issues with hearing? For instance, are you having ringing in the ears? Because this drug is ototoxic and it affects cranial nerve eight. So always ask your patients who are taking streptomycin if they are having any hearing issues. Okay, so that wraps up this video over tuberculosis. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.